and a hush fell over the crowd. Hush! <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, good morning and welcome. I am Anna Wesley, a member of the board at the Unitary Universalist Church in Reston. Um, whether you're on Zoom or here in the church sanctuary, we are so glad you are here with us for this morning's intergenerational worship service. Are we intergenerational? Not intergenerational worship service. Wrong script. Wrong script. <laughs> um, no matter how old you are, or how young you are, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, however you identify and whoever you love, know you are welcome here. Announcements. Okay, UUCR will be holding a newcomer orientation on Saturday, May 4th at 9.30 a.m. Whether you are brand new or new-ish to UUCR, this is an event to attend if you have questions about the Unitary Universalist or UUCR in particular. The, this information, this event, informative event will be hosted by Reverend Eileen and UUCR mem leaders. Breakfast, snacks, and lunch will be provided. Ooh and child care will be available. Um, if you have questions or to RSVP, um, contact the membership co-chair, Kathy Delianis. Okay. Announcements. Oh, I just did the announcement. Hello. So what I also wanted to say is today's sermon will be delivered by Claudia Fleecy. Okay, and I wanted to put a few words about her. Um, Claudia Fleecy became a member of our church in 2022. She and her husband had been living in Europe for the previous 37 years, mostly in Italy. Um, she is also an Italian citizen. In her career as a writer, her articles have appeared in the International New York Times, Newsweek, Fortune, Variety, and many others. She is blessed with two sons, one who lives in Herndon, and she has two grandchildren. She has a passion for dogs, dinosaurs, and dolphins, none of which are relevant to today's service. <laughs> but she also loves the movies, and she did manage to work that in. All right, so um, now let us center ourselves for worship. Oh, did I forget something? Oh, oh, yeah, come on in, come on up. Good. Sorry. Yeah, good. Sorry about that. Um, so hi, I'm Nani Mullen, and I'm barging into the service because today is the, uh, um, it's the last day of our stewardship campaign. So it's the last, well, last time for a little while at least, I'll be coming up here and saying hi. Um, but so I just wanted to update you guys. We, are, we uh, met 92% of our goal. Yes, yeah, exactly, well, yeah, I'm excited. We had 125 pledges, so it was uh, 354,721. Now, hopefully, I think a couple people already mentioned that they're going to pledge a little bit more today, too. So, um, so maybe it'll even go up even more. But to celebrate, we have a lovely cake in the front for after. But I just wanted to say thank you all so much over the past you know, month or so. <laughs> so thanks. Anytime you want to interrupt me with good news and <laughs> cake, go for it. Uh, coffee and cake, hang around because I'll be giving Science Sunday talk today about life, universe, and everything. So that's 20 minutes after the service finishes. Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. So um, let's go ahead and center ourselves for worship. Please take some deep breaths and enjoy the service.
Good morning, buongiorno. Um, today's uh, theme is profiling courage. In The Wizard of Oz, the wizard tells the cowardly lion, you're under the unfortunate delusion that simply because you run away from danger, you have no courage. You're confusing courage with wisdom. There should be no confusion in the Unitarian Church. Courage and wisdom coexist here. Our service today is meant to shed light on that coexistence. It's our yellow brick road, and we don't need ruby slippers to guide us on our journey. Uh, although I actually am wearing them, <laughs> just in case. Our opening hymn today is number 112, Do You Hear? Well, please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing. Chalice lighting words today are by Pat Uribe Lichte. Our chalice is a reminder that in hard times our ancestors and faith acted with courage to bring hope and safety, to bring life itself to threatened people. We light it today as a reminder of who we are called to be in a still dangerous world and despairing with courage and faith we bring ourselves to, to the work before us. Here at UUCR, we have a beloved tradition of singing our covenant together every Sunday. Love is the spirit of this church. Uh, we remain seated as we sing our covenant. And if you are here this morning for the first time, we hope you will accept this song as our blessing to you.
all ages. So if you're feeling young of body, I invite you to come forward. If you like to be a little closer. Good morning, good morning. Ah, wonderful. So our story today is from a Buddhist tale. Once, a little parrot was looking over the forest where she lived, and she saw flames, fire arising in the forest. And she flew over the forest and yelled, run, run, there's a fire, run for the river. But as she flew over the forest, she noticed that many of the animals were trapped by the flames. She was desperate to help her friends, so she went to the river. She dipped down and picked up some water with her wing. She flew over the fire and flipped her wing, so a few drops fell on the fire. Where the, fire, where the water hit the fire, steam rose. And she kept on doing this, picking up water, flipping it on the fire. While she was doing this, devas, or Buddhist gods, looked down and began to laugh. They said, this is ridiculous. This little parrot can't do anything about this. She'll just be hurt herself. Well, one of those devas turned into an eagle and flew down to talk to the little parrot. The eagle said, little parrot, save yourself. Your wings are being singed by the fire, and there must be smoke in your lungs. Go, leave. But the little parrot just continued picking up water and dripping it on the fire. And as she did this, she told the eagle, I don't need your advice. I just need your help. Well, the eagle, hearing that, felt so ashamed and so inspired by the parrot that, she, that the eagle began to cry, crying in the shame. And where those tears hit the fire, hiss, and steam rose. And the eagle kept on crying, and crying until the fire went out. And all of the animals were saved. None were injured, and from that day on, they celebrated the courage of that little parrot. I hope we can remember the parrot, and often, even if we feel very small, there's something we can do. And we'll be talking more about that in the service and in religious education. And we'll also probably be going outside today. Yeah. So after, after we do the opening. So I invite you, anyone in 12th grade or younger who would like to join us, May, and we'll sing them out with Go With Joy. The lyrics will be projected here. service when we share our joys and concerns so that no one has to hold them alone. If you are joining us remotely this morning, you may wish to light a real or virtual candle wherever you are this morning to mark what is on your heart. As members of the in-person congregation here at UUCR, place stones in the water that is on our altar. If those of you at home would like to share what is in your heart today in the congress congregational chat on the screen please write to all attendees and please remember 
that what you share will be made public. Those at home may then read other joys and concerns shared in the chat and then enter into your own time of reflection and prayer as we all listen to Diane play our meditation music. <coughs> may those who wish please come forward at this time. that so faithfully animates our creation. We are grateful for this community that is with us in both times of joy and, and sorrow. We hold in our hearts this morning all who are facing any hardship or difficulty, those who are grieving or facing illness or disability in themselves or friends or loved ones. In particular, we just learned that longtime member Elaine Schwartz has just passed. This morning, we light a candle for all those who have died or are suffering the ravages of war in Ukraine, Israel, and the Gaza Strip. Let us also not forget the ongoing genocide in Darfur. We pray that the international community will learn how to come together to quell these conflicts, to address the causes of the conflicts, and to find ways to heal the pain and resentments born of both of these conflicts. Spirit of Life, teach us your ways of healing and give us the courage to act wisely in the face of many challenges we all face. But in the midst of all this, let us not forget to be grateful for the many gifts and open our hearts to joy. Amen and blessed be.
As a self-funded church, UUCR relies on the generosity of its members and friends to fund daily operations and to ensure the church and its resources are here for us and others now and in the future. Pledges support our worship and music programs, our religious education programs, programs for members and friends, community outreach, and connections to Unitarian Universalism. The second Sunday of each month is our dedicated offering to an organization chosen by the Social Justice and Action Committee. All of today's offerings, except for the pledge payment, which should be clearly marked, will, will go to Shelter House. Shelter House is a community-based nonprofit organization that provides crisis intervention, safe housing, and supportive services to the community members experiencing homelessness and victims of domestic violence in our community. Since its founding in 1981, Shelter House has continued to grow as an organization to accommodate the expanding needs in our community. Today, Shelter House operates five shelter facilities and several housing programs. They recently merged with Family Pass so that they can now also provide long-term case management for those at risk of homelessness. You may make your donation at the link in the chat and on your order of service. Entering your donation into the Charity of the Month donation box in the online form. You can also write a check to UCR with shelter in the memo line and put it in the offering basket or mail it to the church. And of course, you may put cash in the offering basket. Thank you for your generous support of this important community resource. Yeah. 
Many of you here have visited the Museum of Tolerance in Washington, D.C. Oh, not very many. Um, has anyone visited the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles, the one on West Pico Boulevard? Ah, okay, one person, okay. When, when I visited that museum, there was an assembly of names and photographs covering one entire wall of a room in that building. The names and photographs were of some 400 individuals who protected would-be victims of the Nazi killing machine, shielding them, hiding them, helping them escape in spite of the threat to their own lives. A docent at the museum asked me if I could explain what made these unsung heroes behave so bravely. I looked at the descriptions, but there seemed to be little commonality among them. Their ranks included peasants and priests and professors, farmers, philosophers, devout Catholics, and unwavering atheists, no Unitarians, the affluent and the impoverished. But they had all done something so inconceivably brave that it was hard for me to imagine it. My immediate reaction was to ask myself, how did they do that? What kind of courage was that? It's not quite the same as the courage you find on a battlefield. After all, soldiers are trained, if not to be brave, then at least to act in a certain way under fire. So we admire, but we are not necessarily in awe of, a soldier who performs well in battle. But we might be in awe of, say, Joan of Arc, a young woman, a teenager, who wasn't trained to be a soldier and yet performed as well in battle as men with years of experience, and more impressively still, she was apparently calm and noble when captured. Although she was betrayed by her fellow Frenchmen and condemned to death by the English, and she briefly recanted her faith, she then returned, showed conviction in her cause, and was eventually burned at the stake. One might also venture that she was a religious fanatic who was unyielding and narrow-minded in her views, but that position does not jibe with her image as a selfless martyr. Still, what she did was in a quasi-military context. It's not like, say, Miquel Cervetes, a 16th century Spanish physician and philosopher whom some people describe as the original Unitarian, although he was not Unitarian by any current understanding of our faith. He was a medical doctor and a theologian who was among the first and most prominent to reject the doctrine of the Trinity. And for that, he was denounced as a heretic and arrested in France and condemned to the stake. The stake was very popular back then. He escaped with the idea of fleeing to Italy. Uh, who knows why? Because the Pope was obviously not going to be friendly to his cause. Uh, and stopped en route in Geneva, Switzerland, to hear a lecture by John Calvin, who was also not inclined to be friendly to his cause. Calvin had his own political agenda to deal with, so he had Servetus arrested and eventually burned at the stake with a fire made from his own, that is, Servetus' own writings. Talk about irony. So one might say he was courageous and willing to die for his views, but the fact is he escaped from France, he was trying to get away, and presumably he wasn't eager to die a martyr's death. Neither of these cases is in any way similar to that of, say, a farmer hiding his Jew in, uh, hiding a Jew in, uh, in his basement in Nazi Germany or in France, in this case in France. Uh, and we're going to see a very, very brief clip from Inglorious Bastards where a farmer is being interrogated by the villain of the piece. Very brief. That I must have my men enter your home. And conduct a thorough search before I can officially cross your family's name off my list. And if there are any irregularities to be found, rest assured there will be. That is unless you have something to tell me that makes the conducting of a search unnecessary. I might add also that any information that makes a performance of my duty easier will not be met with punishment. Actually, quite the contrary. It will be met with reward. And that reward will be your family will cease to be harassed in any way by the German military during the rest of our occupation of your country.
You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Yes. You're sheltering them underneath your floorboards, aren't you? Yes. Point out to me the areas where they're hiding. It does not end well for the Jews on, in the basement. Uh, the docent explained to me that a study had been done to answer the question of what made these 400 people so brave. And three elements had emerged that were common to every name on the list. First, none of these heroes remembered having been physically punished as a child. Scolded, yes. Slapped on the wrist, maybe. But no one had ever been beaten. Therefore, no one had an inordinate fear of authority instilled as a child. Second, no one remembered hearing racial slurs or epithets from their parents or immediate family members when they were growing up. Yes, some heard remarks made in ignorance, stereotypical shorthand. Some of these people were simple country folk with little or no formal education. But no one recalled insistent vicious remarks about race, religion, sexual preferences, or any other discriminatory classifications from their parental figures. And I say parental figures because some of these people were orphans and didn't have parents, but they all had some sort of parental figure or point of reference. And third, all of these heroes, as children, remember that one parental figure had done something they recalled as being brave. The bravery could have been standing up to a bullying neighbor, or complaining about a corrupt public official, or saving a farm animal from danger. The important thing is that the children were left with the recollection that a parental figure had acted courageously and independently. So hearing this, immediately what came to mind, thinking movies, is the scene in To Kill a Mockingbird, when Atticus Finch shoots the rabid dog. Scout and Jim, his children, realize that their father is courageous because he was willing to put himself in harm's way to do the right thing. Mad dog is not just rabid. Rabies is a disease, and that's why it's dangerous. In the book, Atticus says, Makem, Makem is the town where they lived, Makem's usual disease is racism. And he also says, significantly, courage is when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway and you see it through no matter what. Real courage is when you fight for what's right, regardless of whether you win or lose. And not coincidentally, the American Film Institute has designated Atticus Finch as the greatest hero in cinema, real or fictional. Sorry, Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> of course, losing for the 400 heroes in the museum didn't mean losing a court case or a client or income. It meant, or could have meant, as we saw in Inglorious Bastards, losing one's life and the lives of one's entire family. And those are different stakes, not like the stakes in the Inquisition. Those are different stakes entirely. Listening to the docent, I realized that it had been my good fortune to have had an upbringing similar to that of the heroes. My parents had never inflicted corporate corporal punishment, they'd gone out of their way to avoid stereotyping others, and they had both been brave in facing adversity and defying unreasonable authority. So the first thing I did when I left the museum was to ask my adult children if they had similar impressions of me. And to my relief, they said, don't worry, Mom, you brought us up right. The word right used advisedly, of course. Um, Max is in the audience. Max, please corroborate if anyone asks you after the service. Okay. But I do ask myself if I would have had the courage to do what these 400 people did. And my honest answer is, if I were in that place and time and had small children, I probably would not have done anything to put them in jeopardy, as we saw in the movie clip. I would have chosen the path of injustice in the interests of keeping my family safe. However, if I were in that place and time and had no family, either because I was too young or too old, 
I like to think I would have been as brave as they were, but I'm not sure. A psychology professor, professor at Amherst, Dr. Katherine Saunderson, has studied the question of why people take ethical action, and more specifically, why more people don't take ethical action more often. She classifies the reasons for lack of action into three categories. First, what she calls the perils of ambiguity. Is something bad actually going down? Now, in the case of, say, Kristallnacht, we know that that was bad, and perhaps intervention would have been required. But what if you hear a screaming child in a supermarket? Is that child being kidnapped, or is it simply holding a temper tantrum because its mom or dad isn't buying him the candy that he wants? So you don't always know. Then second, the dangers of group inaction, what's called the bystander effect or bystander apathy. It states that individuals are less likely to offer help to a victim in the presence of other people. So if a single person is asked to complete an ethical action alone, like Good Samaritan sometimes, the sense of responsibility is strong and they will act. However, if a group is asked to complete an ethical action together, each individual will think, well, maybe he'll do it, maybe she'll do it, and the chances of group action are diminished. This theory was prompted by the murder of Kitty Genovese in New York in 1964, and this has been discussed in this, uh, in this hall probably more than once, including recently, about which it was wrongly reported that 38 bystanders, bystanders watched passively and safely from an apartment building while a young woman, Kitty Genovese, was stalked, raped, and murdered. And third, there's the considerable cost, personal, professional, and physical, um, to performing an ethical action. Reverend Aileen mentioned a few weeks ago about the three American soldiers on a train in France who thwarted a hijacking attempt. That's, of course, good. But there are also many instances of Good Samaritans who tried to defend innocent people on streets and subways and elsewhere and were stabbed or shot to death for their actions. Now, another educator and educational philosopher, Dr. Amy Eva, suggests six ways to tap into our capacity for courage, which she defines as not only big, bold acts of courage like the ones we've discussed here before, but also the personal courage it sometimes takes to face a difficult situation day after day, a chronic illness, the loss of a loved one, an unwelcome change in circumstance. Sometimes just getting out of bed to face the day requires a tremendous act of personal courage. She suggests six ways to tap into our capacity for this kind of courage. Start by seeing yourself as courageous. Then get comfortable with mistakes, with fear of failure, which is not to be confused with fear of flying. That's another thing entirely. Uh, courage is going from failure to failure without lack of enthusiasm from the ever quotable Winston Churchill. Third, keep trying, keep at it. Fourth, look for your heroes to help you. If Joan of Arc doesn't do it for you, then how about your neighbor who spoke up at a school board meeting? Five. Clarify your own values. What do I value in myself? What do I stand for? What's important to me? What are some of my successes and accomplishments instead of dwelling on my drawbacks and failures? And six, and most relevant to us, become part of a social force for courage. Courage through community. This is where our church, the Unitarian Church, with shared values inherent in our covenant that we sing every week can play a big role. Saunderson's study suggests the existence of natural born, what she calls moral rebels. And these days, I ask myself more and more, where are they? To be progressive in the US today requires a lot of courage. I'm not suggesting that the US in 2024 is like Europe in the 1930s but if you compare some of Hitler's speeches and some of Trump's recent speeches, there are unsettling similarities. Certainly, the US, in the, the US atmosphere has moved frighteningly close to the McCarthy era 
of the early 1950s. I'm too young to remember that, but that's the case. Or worse, as we hear more and more tales of vindictiveness and cruelty, of book burnings and repression of long established rights, read abortion. In 2023, 4,240 individual book titles were targeted for removal from libraries, up from 2,571 titles in 2022, according to the American Library Association. Book challenges at public libraries rose by 92% in 2023, and in school libraries, challenges rose by 11%. Libraries around the US, in fact, have emerged as a battleground in a larger cultural war. Unsurprisingly, such thought censorship is not new. The Scopes Monkey Trial was in 1925, and the issues it raised seem not to have been resolved at all, notwithstanding the Oscar-recognized movie of 1960, Inherit the Wind. I had to get another Hollywood reference in there. Censorship efforts have become increasingly organized and politicized with the rise of conservative groups that encourage their members to file complaints about books they deem inappropriate and medical procedures they disapprove of, see abortion again. They have the courage of their convictions. What about us? Uh, there's intolerance from the left as well. Unfortunately, I don't have the time here today to, to discuss this, but the situation in Gaza and how it's being spun offer clear examples of unreasonable prejudice and bigotry from the supposedly more enlightened side of the political spectrum. I asked Clarence Darrow, where are you now that we need you? In many ways, therefore, from the left as well as the right, the US has moved in the direction of narrow-minded intolerance, the elections of 2008 and 2012 notwithstanding and many other countries have veered dangerously right. Not UK Brexit right, not only, but much worse. Slovakia and Argentina most recently, the Netherlands, Hungary, my own Italy, Israel of course, and on the verge are France, Spain, and Germany. Things don't look great globally, and the US election this November looms darker still. Do we have the courage to reverse this trend? Do we deserve a place on a current day wall of heroes? And are we serving as good role models for the moral rebels of the next generation? These are questions I ask myself every single day. Shouldn't we all? Amen. Our closing hymn today is um, not in the hymnal, actually. It's a song by Mark Kaplan called Be the Change, and the words are on the back of your order of service. Uh, we sang this together about a month ago, and so I thought we would revisit the song, and this time maybe add a new challenge, which is to add a little bit of body percussion with it. So I think we should do this remaining seated, so that we'll make that a little bit easier. And all we're going to do is take one hand over your heart and do a little pat on and one. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, and. We're going to do our padding while Diane plays the song once through, and then we'll sing.
At the end of The Wizard of Oz, the cowardly lion says to his friends, I never would have, I'm not going to do a Burt Lauren imitation. I never would have found my courage if it hadn't been for you. And so says Reverend Hannah Wells of the First Unitarian Church of Austin, Texas. If I had to describe what the best of religious faith is in plain language, it would be this, that we're all in this mess together. That the saving grace in life is that we always have someone to lean on who cares about us. It's this mutual exchange of energy, love, and inspiration that helps us to find our courage. We can't do these things alone. Amen. We now come to extinguish the flame. But, but not the light of hope and truth, the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry forth in our hearts until we are together again.